Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you. My name is Kiana Irvin. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of History and a Center for Missouri Studies Fellow through the State Historical Society of Missouri. On behalf of my colleague and co-curator, Gary Kramer, who is the executive director of the State Historical Society of Missouri, I welcome you. Gary and I are very pleased to have Professor Lee Vanderveld here to give the opening address of the fall 2016 season of the African American Experience in Missouri lecture series. Uh, we wish to first extend our deepest thanks and our sincere appreciation to UM Interim President Michael Middleton, to Interim Chancellor Dr. Hank Foley, who is here this evening with Dr. Karen Foley, Kevin McDonald, Interim Vice Chancellor for Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity, and Chief Diversity Officer of the University of Missouri System, Nora Azizan Gardner, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Administration for Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity, and Mary Ellen Lohman, Strategic Communications Manager at the State Historical Society of Missouri. We would like to especially thank the staff of the State Historical Society of Missouri, as well as the Division of Inclusion, Diversity, and, Equ and Equity, as well as the many students, staff, colleagues, and friends of the greater MU community who supported our endeavors. So a collaboration of the State Historical Society of Missouri uh, through the Center for Missouri Studies and the University of Missouri's Division of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity, the African American Experience in Missouri Lecture Series is designed to offer the community opportunities to reach a new understanding of present day Missouri by learning about the history of black Americans in the state from the earliest period of statehood to the present. Gary and I are charged with inviting top scholars in the field from across the country who have produced important research on Missouri's black past. Over the course of three seasons, we will host about 10 scholars who will essentially explain how contemporary debates about and struggles over race and inequality, over slavery, over African Americans in US society all bear historical weight. Our spring 2016 season featured lectures by Dr. Diane Muti Burke of the University of Missouri, Kansas City on enslaved Missourians enduring struggle for self-determination. Dr. Martha S. Jones of the University of Michigan on black women and state violence in the case of Missouri versus Celia, a slave. And Dr. Walter Johnson of Harvard University on racial capitalism and empire in the age of Dred Scott. Next month, um, on October 20th, Dr. Miller Boyd of the University of Mississippi will deliver a lecture on black Missouri soldiers during the Civil War. And on November 9th, Dr. Brian Jack of Southern Illinois University Edwardsville will speak on the Exodusters Movement or black migration to St. Louis and other points west during the late 19th century. You can see flyers, actually, um, for more details on those subsequent lectures. So now to this evening's lecture. Professor Lee Vanderveld is a specialist in the fields of slavery and freedom, work law, property law, American legal history, and constitutional law. She is the Josephine R. Witt Professor of Law at the University of Iowa College of Law. She is taught at Yale Law School, at the University of Pennsylvania, and the University of Vienna Law School, where she offered courses and lectured on topics including the right to free mobility, women and empire, ancient Rome and modern America, and American labor law. She is a member of the Wisconsin Bar, the Labor Law Group, and the American Law Institute. In 2011, Professor Vanderveld was the Guggenheim Fellow in Constitutional Studies and was a 2014 College of Law nominee for Outstanding University Scholar of the Year. She's currently a distinguished speaker for the Organization of American Historians. Professor Vanderveld is the author of numerous articles which have been published or will be published in journals including the Journal of Supreme Court History, Georgetown Journal, Journal of Law and Public Policy, and Cardozo Law Review, to name but a few. Her trio of articles published in the Yale and Stanford Law Journals demonstrated the hidden significance of gender in the historical development of rules and contracts, torts, and constitutional litigation. Her most recent books are Mrs. Dred Scott, A Life on Slavery's Frontier, and Redemption Songs, Suing for Freedom Before Dred Scott, both of which were published by Oxford University Press. <laughs> 
Redemption Songs tells 12 stories of enslaved families turning to the courts to establish their freedom based upon the discovery of almost 300 freedom suits brought by slaves in the St. Louis courts. About Redemption Songs, Professor Martha S. Jones, one of our spring 2016 lecturers, writes, Vanderveld leaves no stone unturned. This legal history relies as much upon newspapers, family papers, census returns, and pension files as it does upon the artifacts of the courthouse. Here, Vanderveld exercises the same sense of archival tenacity that characterized her earlier work on Mrs. Dred Scott. The results are layered, dynamic stories that bring to light the grievances that explain why enslaved people turned to the courts. Professor Vanderveld is currently at work on a number of terrific projects. One uses digital research technologies to examine American national expansion in the critical years before the Civil War. As principal investigator for the Law of the Antebellum Frontier Project at the Stanford Spatial History Lab, she's analyzing the legal and cultural mechanisms at work in developing states out of US territories. In celebration of the Constitution's 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery and involuntary servitude, Professor Vanderveld is publishing two articles that build on her classic article, The Labor Vision of the 13th Amendment. She's currently at work on a book project that promises to make important contributions to the field, tentatively titled The Master Narrative of 19th Century American Law, The Significance of Slavery and Its Abolition for American Work Law. The book will explore how master-servant law resisted the forces of modernization and continues to reinforce employee subordination. Professor Vanderveld recently participated in an initiative, and I encourage all of you to look up this initiative, called Dear World, um, which was created by photographers uh, who traveled the world essentially interviewing people, asking them who they are and what they are all about. Subjects are instructed to capture the sentiment in just a few words and to write that sentiment somewhere on their bodies, um, kind of capturing, in a sense, an answer to that question. Professor Vanderveld selected the words, recover the past to chart the future. She's here tonight to draw upon her latest work, which explores a history that stretches beyond Dred Scott to deepen our understanding of slavery, race, and law before the Civil War. Do note that we'll have a Q&A immediately following Professor Vanderveld's talk, as well as a book signing. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Good evening. I've selected a story because there are stories that just call out to be told and this strikes me as one of those stories. I selected a story which is chapter eight of my book, Redemption Songs. Redemption Songs was a surprise because no one knew that there were 300 suits involving slaves in the St. Louis courts. 300 signatures. This isn't even all of them if you do the multiplication, but it's all I could get on the slide. I'm going to tell you the story of the men who represent seven of these signatures tonight. But there are stories behind every single one of these signatures. Recall that slaves were not permitted to read or write. So this is how they would sign their name when they were attesting to probably the most dangerous document that they would ever take pen to paper to, claiming their freedom against the interest of their master. This may be the first time that they'd ever held a pen in their hands. And so some of them are shaky. Some of them look like crosses. Some of them look like X's. But each and every one re represents the person signing their name. Names that have been lost, except for the remarkable fact that we found the cases. And the cases tell their stories. In suing for freedom, 
The slave defies his or her master. One speaks truth to power, but not full truth. The slave is not empowered to tell the whole truth, but enough of the truth to be upsetting to the master, to make a sound discordant with the legitimacy of his or her master's dominion, and enough of the truth to meet the ele elements legally necessary to redemption. That much and no more. At the crux of each of these cases is a story like few others. It's a story told by the slave while still enslaved, a person who is normally expected to be neither seen nor heard. It's written from the slave's perspective, seeking the slave's own objective, freedom. Historians have strained to hear the muffled voices of a silenced population. Slavery itself created that silence, and here is a chorus of songs. Each petitioner's story has a structure. There's a pattern to the discourse, and that is what makes it a song. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The petition, the lawsuit, and the judgment. For that's what's sung in public. That is the public record of the courts, and that's what we were able to find in the St. Louis courthouses over years of searching. But more than that, each redemption song is situated in the flow of multiple changing contexts, a life, other lives, a social relationship, an economic relationship, a social history, and the history of multiple communities. Each redemption song ends by fading into the quiet of private lives. These lives continue after the public conclusion of the lawsuit. The public part of the redemption song is part of an even larger phenomenon that itself has beginnings and endings without clear disjuncture. These lawsuits are dramatic and transformative just like many other songs. Yet the redemption song is a freedom suit unlike other songs because it is not a song of rescue, of mercy, or of grace. It is a song of entitlement that makes it different. In this respect, it's different from other discourses that subordinates voice because it is instrumental, intended to redeem the legal right to free status. The petitioner cannot speak freely and fully Anything extra, anything militant, might impair the desired objective. The song must be spare, conserving the political economy of the resistance it presents. Tonight I want to tell you one of those stories. And it's actually the story of collaboration, solidarity, people helping people, and it's a story of character. I've chosen this story because it's got as many eddies, swirls, and subplots as the Mississippi River, but I've streamlined it a bit for this talk. This is a story you've never heard before. In 1842, Robert Duncan's death marked the end of an era, white Duncans and black Duncans. The white Duncan brothers lost control of the river island, a base, that had been used to smuggle slaves into and out of the upper Mississippi Valley. Duncan's Island, as the wooded sandbar came to be known on maps, was close enough to the city to be convenient, but sheltered enough by trees to be covered, to provide cover. It had been the staging area for smuggling the family slaves for two decades. This is a place of secrecy. This is a place of mystery. This is a place where murders were committed. This is a place where there are unexplained deaths and the coroner barely went there in order to figure out the reasons. All the black Duncan brothers by 1842 had redeemed their freedom, so it's a story with a happy ending. 
The song is sung by two male choruses, one black seeking to redeem their freedom and the other white, resisting by legal and illegal means. A somewhat rogue band of bachelor brothers, the several sons of white Kentucky farmer Jesse Duncan Sr. had reconnoitered slaves here at Duncan's Island for 20 years. From Kentucky, where they first inherited slaves from their father, they had sent their slaves to work at jobs of hard labor in the West, where the bondsmen could earn wages for them. Starting in Hopkins County, they sent them to Shawneetown to mine salt. They sent them back to St. Louis, in and out of the island. They sent them up to Galena to mine lead, all the time doing the heavy work of mining in what was free territory, what was already the state of Illinois. The, wherever the enslaved men sought their freedom, the brothers strong-armed them, seized them, and took them across yet another state border so that they couldn't get back to the courthouse always threatening to carry out the ultimate penalty to sell them south to New Orleans. Both sets of brothers, black and white, were named Duncan. The seven black Duncans became increasingly well-established as hard-working, church-going, free black persons with respectable standing in the St. Louis community. At the same time, the six white Duncan brothers declined in reputation, wealth, and social status. The former slaves' rising success as more of them gained their freedom runs counter to the declension, dissent, demoralization, and ultimately degradation of the brothers who were once their masters. The black Duncan brothers gradually and steadily pulled each other out of slavery, worked their way to freedom and financial independence, while the white Duncan brothers ended their wastrel lives in poverty, drunkenness, and grand schemes that never worked out. This is the story of the Duncan brothers, black and white. This story of redemption begins in 1819 with the death of Jesse Duncan Sr. and the division of his household by his will. Jesse Duncan divided his slaves among his sons. There was no surviving Mrs. Jesse Duncan, and the two Duncan sisters were provided for by being married off. Jesse Duncan had settled a homestead in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. He hired out his slaves for wages at the salt mines just across the Ohio River boundary that separated the free Northwest Territory from slave Kentucky. At his death, he divided the 11 slaves among his eight sons and daughters, and with this stroke of a pen, the fates of 11 enslaved people were determined as they were allocated among his children. Ultimately, and this is the point, most of them found their way west to St. Louis to establish their freedom in the St. Louis court. The Duncan brothers growing up without a mother or a father in Hopkins County, Kentucky, were truly wild boys. They got involved in numerous incidents of fighting and feuding with their neighbors. Two brothers burned down one neighbor's smokehouse. Others charged their horses through neighbor's property simply to rip up the place. Occasionally, they simply physically attacked their neighbors. They engaged in this mischief, threats, and violence. And they backed each other up when the need arose. Collectively, they terrorized their neighbors so significantly that some of their victims were afraid to sue for justice. Each bachelor brother had a slightly different profile, but as a clan, they appeared to coordinate their endeavors. One brother would bring others into his big plans, and whenever some big plan failed and someone threatened to foreclose on a debt by levying upon a slave, the others quickly resisted by shifting ownership around, claiming that a different brother owned that slave about to be seized by the sheriff and sold off for a debt. This shell game of intentionally obfuscating who owned which slave worked more than once, as you will see. <laughs> 
Each brother was susceptible to a slightly different vice, however. Brother John, the youngest, was given to drink and to succumbing to others' influence. Young John followed his teenage brothers into trouble in his youth, and in his adulthood, he was completely dependent upon them to the extent that they eventually appointed a guardian for him. Brother Coleman was the risk taker. He was the gambler. Although he was always ready to cheat someone, he was also equally susceptible to getting cheated by others. Coleman was often in the middle of some scheme that went awry. Coleman responded to disappointed schemes by fighting, retaliatory assaults, and suing retaliatory lawsuits. Everybody seemed to like brother Jesse Jr. and he might have been the most responsible of the lot, but he died young. It was James who was the all round clever mastermind of schemes. He was the tough guy. James was the gang leader in kidnapping and smuggling the family slaves from place to place. He was more clever than brother Coleman Coleman's schemes usually blew up in his face. James sometimes succeeded. James was sued for freedom at least 12 times in three different courthouses on the Mississippi Valley by the Duncan slaves. Wherever the brothers landed, the court records are peppered with acrimonious disputes brought by the Duncan brothers and against the Duncan brothers. But eldest brother Robert left the family early and he's the one who claimed Duncan's Island. He claimed Duncan's Island by taking up with the ferryman's wife and eventually throwing him over and getting the island in the bargain. He usurped both the ferryman's wife and his land. Robert had no real occupation or obvious means of support. He lived under the radar, he stayed under the radar, and people said that he owned a large quantity of slaves. Duncan's Island was a landmark off the lower part of St. Louis. <coughs> you could see where it was when the steamboats turned the river. The island was the site of unexplained deaths and a fair amount of clandestine transfer because it was remote from surveillance. The Duncan brothers were acutely aware that you could do things on the island. You could do things in the Mississippi River that you couldn't do on either shore. And they played off those limits. If the white Duncan brothers formed something of a clan, the several people who were owned as slaves by them formed a countervailing social network. These men, akin to a family but not necessarily blood related, Jonathan, Jerry, Shadrach, Vincent, Gilbert, Joe, Swansea, Ralph, all men and then Millie, the one woman who stays behind at the cabin to take care of the younger brothers, to cook, to clean, to chop the wood. These men and this woman all take care of each other and pull each other out of freedom out of slavery and into freedom. Although they were not related by blood, they were bound by a common household past. They had been owned simultaneously by the same master, and they used that past to connect with each other and to free themselves one after another from slavery. So in the manner that freed slaves tended to take their master's names, St. Louis acquired two Duncan families, one white, and one black, separated by race and by experience of servitude. But from 1829 to 1835 and almost 15 lawsuits, the black Duncan house, housemates eventually beat the white Duncan brothers in three different courthouses. The first Duncan to leave was Robert, the oldest. I'm gonna take you back to the island. And in all likelihood, 
he freed Jonathan, a black man that he inherited from his father's will. He emancipated Jonathan relatively early after the will. Now, although the deed says that he is doing this for his uh, good feeling towards Jonathan, my assumption is that Jonathan actually paid his master for his freedom. Robert was not known to be magnanimous. 23-year-old Jonathan remained in St. Louis as a dairyman, selling and delivering milk. By the first year of his emancipation, he already owned a small piece of land suitable for pasturing cows. In the second year of his emancipation, he had bought a cabin and founded the first African church in St. Louis. It's interesting that both Robert and Jonathan gained their foothold in the community by taking up with a land-owning woman. As Robert gained the island by taking up with Sally, the ferryman's wife, so too did Jonathan seem to achieve his start by marrying Fanny, a wealthy, free woman of color. Fanny Klinger owned cash, a house, and cows. Though Fanny was older than Jonathan, they married. And it's quite likely that Jonathan's freedom was purchased by Fanny with Fanny's money. She had the wealth to do so. Thereafter, Jonathan was a man of status. He was always listed prominently in the city directories as the dairyman. Jonathan bought that log cabin, founded the first African church in St. Louis, and he was the base. He was the oldest brother. He was the one from which the others could wrestle their freedom. Thus, two men named Duncan, one white, Robert, living a subsistence existence close to the river with no identifiable means of earning a living, and the other, black, Jonathan, with his cows, his pasture land, and his dairy on higher ground, became the St. Louis focal points for the subsequent contests and continued captivity and freedom among their respective brothers. One took the high ground the other, the low ground. Though Jonathan was freed, his housemates were not as lucky. Four Duncan slaves were set to work at the salt mines in Illinois. For a slave to work in, the, in Illinois for an extended period of time with his master's consent was the event that would eventually bestow upon him freedom. Despite Illinois' ban on slavery, however, many slaves were sent to the Illinois salt mines near Shawneetown because the inland nation needed salt. The inland nation, far from the shore, could not get salt from the sea. So the government treated the saline lick as a natural resource of sufficient importance to be run as a government-leased monopoly. Mountains of salt a substance as necessary to life on the frontier as was water, were, were measured in thousands of barrels of bush, thousands of bushels and manufactured by slaves at the saline lick. The reason that slaves were used at the saline lick is because the work was so hard. The work of boiling off salt in the huge furnaces was so hot and it was so hard that they could not find white men to hire to do the work. To accommodate this, Congress actually made an exception to the Northwest Ordinance, and Illinois carried that into statehood. It allowed slaves to work at the saline, not become free, provided they stayed there no longer than 60 days. The consequence was that slaves were cycled into the saline and out. Every 59 days, a slave would be taken out for a week only to be brought back for another 59 days after a short period of time had passed. Five different Duncan slaves worked at the salt mines, Vincent, Joe, Gilbert, Swansea, and Ralph. But I want to tell you first about Vincent, because he's the one who started it all. 
Vincent was the most proactive of the black Duncan brothers, and since he was sent to the Salines, he, he figured out a way to prolong his stay in Illinois territory by seeking extra work. Vincent was a stout black man with an afflicted left eye. That left eye would give him trouble. Vincent cleverly came up with excuses to avoid returning in the wagon to Kentucky on the 59th day. This independent streak annoyed the white Duncans who were his masters. But in the division, Vincent was assigned to John, the alcoholic younger brother. Vincent was able to cajole his young master into letting him stay by actually feigning an interest in freedom, saying he never wanted it. And he was allowed to stay. Eventually, his extended stay got to the older brothers. They knew what was up. They knew what was at risk. They knew what was at stake. And when Vincent eventually refused to return that many times, the older brothers simply kidnapped him and took him by force. And they didn't take him back to Kentucky. They took him to the island. Vincent needed a strong hand, it was thought, and younger brother John wasn't that guy. So Vincent was taken to Roberts and set to work in brickyards. In St. Louis, Vincent realized that he was free. He realized he had stayed more than 59 days. In fact, he'd planned it. And so once he got to St. Louis, he went to court. He's the first person to sue for freedom. Now, in response to his lawsuit, James kidnapped him. Now, they had kidnapped slaves before, and they would kidnap slaves again. But this time, James was caught red-handed. They found James in a canoe just off the island. They found Vincent tied in ropes, hidden behind a bush. His, his, his mouth muffled so he couldn't call out, but the sheriff found him and brought Vincent safely back to court. Thereafter, the court issued an order saying that the Duncan brothers could not mess with Vincent any longer. His case would go to trial. When the case went to trial, however, Vincent, with the afflicted eye, couldn't look the jury straight in the eyes. He looked to the side. The jury thought he was not trustworthy. And that's what they wrote in the judgment. And they found against him the first time. In 1827, when the federal exception to the Salines expired, the Duncan brothers moved their slaves from the Salines upriver to Galena. Coleman, master of clever schemes, succeeder at none, built a boat. However, he hired a carpenter who had never built a boat before. <laughs> and although the boat was described as looking somewhat like this, as soon as it got out into the Mississippi River, it sunk, <laughs> leaving Coleman and two of the slaves that were headed for Galena in the water. From there, they had to swim to shore, and eventually Coleman got them up to Galena, but Coleman had another lawsuit that he could bring. In Galena, four slaves were set to work mining lead now. And this is actually an image taken from the time, demonstrating, if you look a little bit more carefully, these are obviously African American men who are performing the hard labor as the other guys do the talking. This time, it's lead rather than salt. Four men are set to working in the lead mines in Galena, in the free state of Illinois, under no exception. The salt exception had expired. And then one day, James comes to town, and there's a flurry of activity. The flurry of activity is that James begins to cheat people at cards. And they begin to sue him, and they begin to attack him. And so there's all this flurry of pandemonium in the court dockets of Galena. But the reason he's there 
is to re-seize the four slaves. So that in 1827, in May, four lawsuits are brought by, Ray, by Ralph, Swansea, Joe, and Gilbert, all against James, all to establish their freedom in an Illinois court. This should have been a slam dunk. They should have won this case and easily. James had no basis to defend, but he was very clever and he had a plan. He came into court and of course he said what the brothers had always said before, I don't own these men. It's my brother Coleman and Coleman was nowhere to be found. But just as soon as James left the courthouse and the men were released, not because they were unable to win their suit, but because they'd named the wrong guy, James kidnapped them, put them on the next steamboat, and took them back to the island. In St. Louis, it's where the court case continues. The four enslaved men would find their way to court again from the island. They could as easily get to town as they could be taken from it. And when they got to town and they filed for their freedom, immediately two of them were kidnapped and taken across the Mississippi to the Illinois side. This caused the two others to go into hiding. Gilbert and Swansea's case never went to trial because they got help from two of their brothers. Jonathan, by now, had a very prosperous dairy business. He had bought real estate. He had employees. He had a big concern. And so he offered to buy Gilbert's freedom until he learned that Gilbert had already gone to court in Galena, and there's no reason he should pay for it. Shadrach offered to buy Swansea's freedom, and so he did. And so within two months, two of the brothers were pulled into freedom and out of slavery by two of their brothers. Joe unfortunately died and all that the court docket says is Joe dies court dismiss, a case dismissed. With Joe dead, Swansea free, Gilbert free, all that remains of the men are Vincent and Ralph. Now this is where the, the story takes a legal turn and I won't um, go into it, but it's in the book. This goes to the Missouri Supreme Court four times and eventually they win. Ralph's case reinvigorates Vincent's case. Remember, he's lost at the jury once before. And at the end of the day, all of them are free. In 1835, they close down the farm at Hopkinsville and they remove Millie. Where do they take Millie? To Galena, but the Duncans are known there. So they take her across the river to Dubuque and she finds her way back to Galena and she files suit and you know how the story goes. James kidnaps her, takes her down on the next steamboat. She finds herself in St. Louis. Here she's got four more brothers who have established their freedom. And so what does James do? He kidnaps her once more and he takes her across the river to Belleville on the other side of the river. It's at the Belleville level that you find out that Millie has a daughter because there, there are two suits, one for Millie and one for Anne. Now, the end of the story is that with the exception of the death of Joe, they all achieve their freedom and they all achieve their freedom in the St. Louis courts or they were able to purchase their freedom. Vincent, Shadrach, Jerry, and Jonathan remained in St. Louis. Jonathan was undoubtedly the most successful of his brothers. With his several employees, with his uh, burgeoning dairy business, he was able to expand into real estate. And he brought 
uh, he bought an extended portion of 7th Street, which came to be known as Clabber Alley, because that's where the dairy, uh, the dairy curds were thrown out. Clabber Alley is where uh, Dredd and Harriet Scott uh, found refuge uh, for three of the years when they thought that they were free before the United States Supreme Court and the Missouri Supreme Court changed its mind. After Fanny died, James married again. Shadrach had a successful hauling business. He had horses, he had wagons, he married. He raised five children. Vincent never married, but he became a waiter. He lived a long life, well into the 1890s, probably the longest of them all. Swansea lived out his life as a respected dairyman. And this is him. This is actually Swansea. He went back to Galena, and in Galena, he bought a horse, a wagon, and he delivered water. He was so famous in town that when tourism started to flock to Galena, he was photographed, and his image was in a stereopticon, two images of Swansea side by side, but fully identified as Swansea. He too married, he had five children, he lived a long and one believes happy life. The White Duncan brothers, the story's just the reverse. This one I'm gonna truncate. You don't need to know the number of times they got drunk and fell off their horses. <laughs> the number of times that they decided that they were gonna hire somebody to get a horse because they thought that the horse was a prize-winning filly only to learn that the people had set them up and it was the wrong horse. The end of the story ends with all of them having frittered away all of their wealth, having lost all of their slaves despite their efforts at exploitation and kidnapping. And at the end, the only thing that remains in Robert's estate, the only thing of value is the island. But you don't see the island here, do you? When Robert died, the probate was settled by one of the remaining sisters who came from Kentucky in order to settle it. It had to be ended. She sold the remnants of the estate to Jonathan and Shadrach. <laughs> to make the conquest of the White Duncan brothers complete, to make sure that there was no way that there was any interest out there that could come back and haunt them, to make sure that their freedom and the freedom of their sister and their brothers was in fact safe, they bought the remnant of the estate. So what became of Duncan's Island? Well, a young West Point engineer named Robert E. Lee was sent to St. Louis to get rid of it. It was interfering with the steamboat traffic, and eventually it washed away. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for a terrific presentation. Um, I know many people in the audience, and I know you probably have some questions, so this will be a great time to, to ask them. Um, I'll take the liberty of asking the first one, and if you could just speak to um, your interest in the topic. We were talking a bit about that before the lecture. Um, what brought you to these suits? You know, I started these, uh, this, well, I started discovering these because I wanted to recover a sense of where woman, women stood in the Constitution. And I had been teaching constitutional law for some time before I learned that Dred Scott had a wife and daughters. How had that escaped me? Why didn't I know that? And so I set about trying to find out who they were. Well. I was lucky in finding the diary of Harriet's 
master in St. Louis, but I didn't know what happened to them for the 10 years after they came back to St. Louis. And hence, I had to try to find a cohort, other people like them, who would have lived in the same circumstances. And I began discovering freedom suits. I can remember the first day that I went to the St. Louis, um, I went to the St. Louis courthouse and I had to find this room which literally was on a floor without a number because it was like all the way in the back. And I had this camera because I was frightened that if I opened these things up and they crumbled, I'd be the last person who saw them and people wouldn't believe me. So I meticulously photographed everything. But over the course of several years, with the assistance of wonderful people in Missouri, a whole team of researchers, we were able to find 300. And that made me think we had to recover this. We had to recover this past. <laughs> Just shout it out. <laughs> I have a question about the numbers. So you have 300 uh, cases. How many of them were brought by women? And how many of them were successful? Yeah, I can tell you that. Um, there, are, uh, there are 300 cases, but sometimes the same person sues twice because they lose and then they go back and they sue again. So we have 239 litigants. They're organized into families. And what's remarkable is that the leading litigator in most of these suits is a mother. As soon as a mother establishes her freedom, you see children's suits like, like um, cars, uh, behind a, a, a railroad engine, and you find more suits. We don't find um, Millie's daughter, Anne, even mentioned in the lawsuit until Millie's already filed suit twice. The notion here is that if the mother's freedom can be established, it'll be a whole lot easier for the children's freedom to follow. And since it's a pretty tense situation to be in litigation against one's master, Better to protect one's children for a while, at least until the point when you can bring them forward to get their freedom. That's what Dredd and Harriet did, exactly that same pattern. The answer about winning, people die um, and uh, people give up. But for those who stay the course and pursue this, and sometimes it takes years, the majority ends in victory. So if you count up the judgments, there's more judgments of freedom than there are dismissals. And I think that's pretty surprising and kind of sensational. Have you sold the rights? When is the movie going to production? Oh, That's a script you've written. Well, thank you very much. No, I'd love to make a movie of it. And if anybody, I'm not in the movie world, but if anybody knows about it, I'd be, I'd be delighted to have this brought to the big screen because I think this is a story that should be told. I think this is a story that people should know about. Um, you didn't say anything about lawyers. Did these people need lawyers? And if so, what kind of people brought them? Or if they didn't have lawyers, how did they pull this off? Missouri was pretty unique in one respect. And now I'm, now I'm talking like a law professor. There's a unique aspect to Missouri's law. I haven't found it in any other slave state, and it's this. If a slave makes his way to the clerk and tells a reasonable story that would suggest that they have a good claim to freedom, the judge is obligated to appoint a lawyer. The judge has to find the lawyer, and the lawyer may try to charge for it, but the lawyer can't get out from under it. So if the slave can't pay, it becomes a pro bono case. In no other state, in no other state in the South, in no other slave state, is there a law that literally gives poor people lawyers and 
whether you're a slave or not, this informa pauperis is really quite unique. I'm wondering if you encountered, you know, Mark Twain always claimed that uh, his views on Missouri's racial profile were more contained in Puddinhead Wilson than in Huck Finn. Puddinhead Wilson's the story of, you know, a slave baby that's switched by mothers at birth, and the slave is raised as a white baby, and of course they wind up just like these people. In fact, Puddinhead's a lawyer, as I remember it. Yeah, you know. And also the mother having being involved with the salvation of the child, her, her main concern being the, the themes are all there. And uh, you know, it's so complicated around here, it kind of helps me understand it. I want to make one connection to Mark Twain because I haven't read Puddin' Head Wilson, I have to confess. And the one connection that I want to make is that Vincent, remember? Vincent, the first man mm -hmm. to file suit, at one point, he sold to James Clemens for a year and a half. James Clemens is Samuel Clemens' uncle. That's on, yeah, well, I'll have to talk about it. It's all connected. That was really marvelous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, will you speak to the issue of invisibility of these black families in terms of our memory and the narratives that are told? I think it's really important sometimes when you focus on like the incidents that happen related to black people in history and then they disappear. So if you would talk about how they become invisible and what that means to you. Yeah, I would be glad to. Um, this relates to something that I'm, I'm firmly committed to and that's that our vision of history is winner's history. When I first wrote uh, my first piece on Harriet, having discovered her, having figured out this amazing thing, and uh, I sent it to some publishers. The response was, but they lost, didn't they? As if, right? As if their lives didn't matter if they had lost the lawsuit. And if we only looked as far as the fact that they lost, we would have never seen the 300 people, the majority of whom win. We would have never seen the struggle. We would have just seen, as people used to describe the Dred Scott, as the loser case. It wasn't. At the time that that case was, was filed, current thinking would have dictated that they would have won. We forgot that. We lost that memory because we only remember victories, and then we rewrite the history based on a later victory. I um, wanted to end by giving you something. Thank you very much for inviting me here. And it's just a card, but you can use it as a bookmark or whatever. I, I'm just so um, enchanted with the signatures of the slaves that I made some postcards and I thought I would distribute them so you'd have something to take away. Thank you. Let's take